Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the Morphe Auction House taking a look at a very rare and very cool Browning model of 1919 tank gun. And this is actually the first uh, use of the Browning machine gun as an air-cooled gun. Uh, these of course initially were developed as water-cooled guns, the model of 1917. And when we think about them as air-cooled guns, what we think about today is typically the 1919A4, which was the standard infantry air-cooled medium machine gun used by the United States in World War II. But that gun actually developed from this one. And this was developed because we needed a machine gun for tanks. So in 1918, uh, the Allies, the British, the French, and the Americans are starting to use substantial numbers of tanks in combat in World War I. And, uh, well, they have to be armed. So the French are generally using Hotchkiss model of 1914 heavy machine guns in their Renault FT-17 tanks. And that's fine, but the United States starts making those tanks ourselves, and it's not really practical to ship machine guns over from France, mount them in American tanks, and ship them back. It's really much preferable if there's a machine gun that can be just built in the U.S. and put right into those tanks. And, well, they didn't have one. They didn't want to use a water-cooled gun, because you don't want that water jacket sticking out the front of the tank where it can get damaged and then cause the gun to be unserviceable. So the first thing they did was actually use Marlin model of 1917 guns. These had been developed as... this is basically a, a, a revised gas system on the Colt 1895 potato digger. Uh, and these were manufactured in large numbers as aircraft guns, and those were retrofitted, modified, and used as tank guns early on. But it, they weren't nearly as... they weren't all that great. Um, they had a, they left a lot to be desired. What people wanted uh, was John Browning to convert that 1917 fantastic water-cooled gun into an air-cooled version. And that is precisely what he did here. By September of uh, 1918, September 30th of 1918, this gun was actually adopted. It went through trials so fast. Uh, the trial took place like five days before it was actually adopted. There were no committee hearings, there was no bureaucracy. It was a couple of ordnance officers, Hatcher being one of them, uh, who basically told Browning, hey, we need an air-cooled tank gun. They did yeah, a couple months of development. The very first ones had a big aluminum shroud, and they were very high rate of fire guns, and that wasn't necessary. Uh, nor was it desirable, actually. And so Browning worked on it, came up with this, they put it through an endurance test, it worked, the Ordnance Department officers went, awesome, it works, it's adopted. And it was formally ready for production November 16th, 1918. So five days after the war ends. There had initially been a contract of 40,000 of these things uh, planned out, uh, actually signed by Westinghouse. That was reduced to 10,000 when it was actually adopted, because the war was over. Uh, and then it was further reduced to 500, although the numbers came back up, and between 1 and 2,000 of these were actually manufactured uh, to equip in tanks. So uh, this would lead to some other stuff which we'll talk about in a moment. But first, we should take a look at how this is different from just your regular ordinary 1919A4. So as a tank gun, the requirements for this thing were actually pretty simple. They didn't need a high rate of fire. In fact, they wanted a relatively low rate of fire. They preferred something like 400 to 450 rounds per minute. Uh, the major concern... oh, and I should say, they also didn't anticipate firing at ranges beyond about 100 yards. They didn't anticipate sustained fire. This was actually really kind of a pretty simple uh, requirement to, to design a gun around. And that would lead to a bunch of the design decisions in here. So starting at the back, um, the main concern, even with, you know, without needing a sustained high rate of fire, that sort of thing, uh, the Browning system fires from a closed bolt, which means when you're not shooting, there is a chamber, a cartridge in the chamber, sitting there. So with a rifle, that's no big deal. With a machine gun like this, you can theoretically have a cook-off, which is to say, if you shoot enough that the barrel gets so hot that the cartridge sitting in the chamber absorbs that heat, the powder gets hot enough to detonate by itself without having the primer struck. That's a cook-off. That's a problem. And so they did a couple things to alleviate that concern. First off, the standard, the requirement, was only that it be able to fire 300 rounds without a cook-off. Uh, if you fired four or 500 rounds, like in a single minute, the thing would cook off. But uh, 300 wasn't so much of a problem. And then they also added this bolt stop. So with this guy... We can pull the bolt back, lift this lever up, 
and it's got a nice little hook there that holds on to the bolt handle. That prevents the gun from having a round sitting in the chamber. It also keeps the barrel open, which in theory will speed up cooling a little bit, because you've got some airflow going through there. Uh, this was introduced on the tank gun, and this is a particularly... this is the first version of this lever, which includes a little bent out section right here, which makes it easier to get a, a finger on that and uh, engage or disengage it. Later on in production that little bump would go away, and this would turn into just a flat piece. The barrel length here was also largely determined by these tank gun specifications. Because they didn't anticipate firing at any extended distance, they figured that they didn't need the ballistic capability of a properly full length barrel. So this has a barrel of just over 18 and a half inches, which means, well, it's a little more compact sticking out of the tank, less, less gun out there to get damaged. Uh, and this would stick around through a couple iterations before it was lengthened uh, when the, the 1919 was turned into a standard infantry gun instead of just a tank gun. Uh, these oval cooling slots are also rather distinctive. Um, in the, the mass production World War II version of this that we're all used to seeing, um, they used just round holes for cooling instead of these oblong slots. Not directly related to the tank usage, but I do want to point out that uh, this gun does not have the reinforcing stirrup uh, around the bottom of the receiver here. That was something that was found to be a weak point in the Brownings, both the 1917s and the 1919s. And standard production guns would add a reinforcing bracket here. They would uh, retrofit that on 1917s. And if you go look at a picture of a 1919, you'll find that the bottom plate, instead of sitting entirely inside the receiver like this, uh, actually uh, sits over the top and it has big reinforcements all the way uh, in the... well, through the entire back half of the receiver. This is a particularly early gun not having that. Now the sights are also something that we need to take a look at on this guy, uh, because there don't really appear to be any. This, uh, this was developed, like I said, from the 1917. So on the 1917 gun, the rear sight's sitting out here. Well, they didn't need, you know, a 2800 uh, yard rear sight on a tank gun that's expected to shoot 100 meters, or 100 yards. So instead, there were two different options that they came up with. Um, and the first one was just what was called a tube sight. And this was a system that the British uh, liked and were using. And, uh, and in fact, we'll take a look at it in just a moment. But I do want to point out there was a lot of back and forth. The, the French pretty much came out and said, oh yeah, we tried that tube sight thing, it kind of sucks, you really need to have a telescopic sight on a tank gun, it works a lot better. The British stuck with this though, and this was a lot quicker and easier to get into service. So the first of the American guns used tube sights like this. Uh, they would later add brackets, and the 1919A1 uh, would be retroactively designated. Uh, but that would be the version of the American gun that had uh, an optical sight, a, a telescopic sight mounted on it. So this tube sight sort of thing uses a pretty standard uh, front sight, which is adjustable for both windage and elevation. See the slot there, and there's an oblong slot here. You can loosen that screw, adjust this up or down if you need to. But note that unlike the 1919A4s, this is mounted on the front of the receiver. It's not up here. It doesn't fold. It's just a, a fixed kind of unique pattern of, of front sight. And then we've got this tube in the back. And when I say tube, I mean literally a hollow tube. This is sort of, sort of like an aperture sight. Well, it is an aperture sight, but it uses a long tube instead of just a short aperture. And to be honest, I'm not really sure why. Um, but this is the system that the British really liked. This is what they used uh, with their uh, Hotchkiss portative uh, tank machine guns. So there's your, your sight picture. And then, of course, this whole gun would be mounted in a ball socket uh, in the tank turret, or the tank uh, gun sponson, depending on what sort of tank it was in. And, uh, and there'd be a hole in that uh, ball joint to allow you to see down, see outside with that sight picture. The top cover latch is a little bit non-standard uh, by what we would normally expect, because of course this is prior to the 1919A4. So it works the same way, this spring-loaded block uh, locks the top cover down, but normally this would handle a little differently when there's a rear sight there. So on this one just pull that back, and then you can pop the top cover open. Note that the top cover does not have the extra 
uh, hardware out here that allows it to lock or use spring tension to stay in the upright position. Uh, none of that. <laughs> this, this will just fall down on you if you let it. And of course we should take a quick look at the markings. This was actually designated as a Browning tank machine gun model of 1919. Uh, and it was the first 1919 pattern gun. So that's why it doesn't have this A designation. That was retroactively added about ten years later. Uh, these were all manufactured by Westinghouse, by the way, uh, which is what you see on this one. So after the war this would go on to be, well, the development of the 1919A4. Uh, it was first, there were a couple other versions experimented with for tank guns. There was, uh, well, the version with the telescopic sight. Uh, it was then tested and adopted by the US cavalry. And this whole time the nomenclature is a little fuzzy. It wasn't until 1929 that this was actually formally redesignated the 1919A1. Uh, or rather the version with the telescopic sight was the 1919A1. The version adopted by the cavalry was designated the 1919A2 in 1932. Uh, and it still had a short barrel at that point, and they would go on to develop it uh, further into the A4 version, which had most notably, most distinctively, a longer barrel. The, uh, the idea of the short necessary range, which made sense for tanks, didn't really follow for the infantry guns. And that's why the 1919A4s have substantially longer barrels than these guys. So uh, this is an extremely rare gun today. Very few of them survived because most of them were modified and adapted and updated um, or simply lost and scrapped over time. So uh, if you would be interested in having it yourself, it would certainly be a fantastic addition to any Browning machine gun collection. Take a look at the description text below. You'll find a link there to ForgottenWeapons.com, and from there you can get over to the Morphe catalog page on this gun. It comes with a number of accessories, including a Colt 1918 commercial tripod, which I didn't have up in the video because it's not the tripod that this would have been used on as a tank gun. Um, but it is a very nice tripod, and that's also included with the gun. So uh, it also, of course, has pictures of everything, description, price estimate, all that good stuff. Thanks for watching.